Good morning, everyone. Um, well, I finished getting set up here. We're going to be in Hebrews chapter 3 this morning. Hebrews chapter 3. And for those watching, thank you. Thank you for spending time with us today. Um, and if you're listening to the recording later on or watching it, um, thank you again for taking time out of your busy day, out of all the YouTube videos or Facebook videos or what, whatever it may be. Thank you for taking the time to, to check us out. We hope that you will have been blessed and the Lord will have spoken powerfully to you after this message. Um, and if he has, please let us know, and I'll give you more information on that after today's message. But as I've, you've heard me say before many, many times, <clears throat> I believe all of you, the Lord has all of you here for a reason. Um, and, you know, if you really are open to the Holy Spirit this morning, he will speak powerfully to each and every one of you. Um, so, I've titled today's message, Jesus is greater than Moses. Jesus is greater than Moses. We'll be in Hebrews chapter 3. Back when uh, we covered chapters 1 and 2, the author introduced some major themes of this letter. There, he also informed us that Although for a season, Jesus was made lower than the angels in order to relate to us and to die for, for us. In reality, he is far greater than any angel. Yet, some of his early Jewish readers may have been thinking or saying to themselves, Okay, I can see now how that Jesus is greater than angels, but he can't be greater than the great lawgiver, Moses. Well, in this new section of Hebrews chapter 3, the author answers this question by shifting his argument to the superiority of Christ over Moses. In our journey through this letter, this transition will take us one step closer to the center of the theology of this entire book, of the book of Hebrews, which is this. Jesus Christ is the climax of redemptive history and the fulfillment of all of God's Old Testament promises, prophecies, and patterns. And in addition to that, um, I think we'll also have time to cover the other half of Hebrews chapter 3, where after this, the writer of Hebrews will give a warning and some encouragement as well. So before we get into that first part of Hebrews chapter 3, let's pray this morning. Lord God, um, it's a wonderful time of worship, and we do, we pray that you received it with with a smile on your face, Lord, and I pray that you will continue to move powerfully here this morning. That you open up hearts and minds, not just here in this room, but anyone watching or listening to this message. Lord, there's a lot of stuff going on around the world. And we know that it, it reminds us that we, we're we're just getting, we're inching closer and closer to, to your arrival. When we'll finally be face to face with you, Lord, and you will usher in your heavenly kingdom. We don't fear in that, Lord. We don't have fear of that. We, we actually, that gives us hope. Because what you offer is a lot better than what this world will ever offer. So as I said, Lord, I pray that you will fill this room with your spirit. Use me as your instrument, Lord, to speak your truth unashamedly and boldly. And may we continue to glorify you now in this time. Pray this in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, Hebrews chapter 3, verse 1. And there the word of God says, 
Therefore, holy brothers and sisters who share in a, in a heavenly calling, consider Jesus, the apostle and high priest, the apostle and high priest of our confession. He was faithful to the one who appointed him, just as Moses was in all God's household. household. For Jesus is considered worthy of more glory than Moses, just as the builder has more honor than the house. Now, every house is built by someone, but the one who, but the one who built everything is God. Moses was faithful as a servant in all God's household as a testimony to what would be said in the future. But Christ was faithful as a son over his household. And we are that household if we hold on to our confidence and the hope in which we boast. Now, similar to what we saw in chapter 2, verse 1, with for this reason, the word therefore here in verse 1 connects what the author had just said and what he's about to say, which is basically this. In light of the great salvation provided, consider Jesus. He is the merciful and faithful high priest who has tasted death for everyone and is the source of us are the source of our salvation. He therefore deserves our full consideration. But before he gets into the details of his next point, the author here identifies his readers as holy brothers and sisters and those who share in the heavenly calling. This form of address, what it does now, it brings together into proper perspective, the words that he brought up in chapter 2, verses 10 and 11. You see, as believers, we're indeed brothers and sisters, not only with one another, but with Jesus, our source of salvation. And we're all holy because he has made us so. We also now share in the heavenly calling because God is bringing us to glory. Now, it seems that the author may have had in mind our high privilege of being invited to participate in the future dominion and joy of God's king, his son, Jesus Christ. Since now this is who we are, we're to focus our thinking on the one who is both the apostle and the high priest of our Christian profession. The first of these titles, Paul points to the Lord Jesus as the one sent forth by God as the supreme revealer of the Father, while the second picks up the role of high priest he mentioned in the last two verses of chapter 2. Now, before detailing how Jesus is greater or better or more superior than Moses, in verse 2, we do see how he shares one aspect in which he was admittedly similar to Moses. He was faithful to God just as Moses was also faithful in God's house. Now, the house here doesn't just simply, isn't just simply the place God dwelt in the tabernacle, but it also refers to the entire sphere in which Moses represented God's interest, which was primarily the house of Israel, God's ancient earthly people. Now, if you're unfamiliar with Jewish history, and if you don't come from that background, or uh, it may be difficult for you to maybe truly appreciate the awesome reverence that's been accorded to Moses 
by his people, by the Jewish people. See, to this day, he's revered as probably the greatest of all Hebrews and probably the greatest man of history. Now, this here is important to understand. If anyone really wants to get anything or anything from the message the Holy Spirit is saying in this chapter, and I'll tell you why. First, we must understand that Moses was divinely chosen for this epic task. His life was miraculously preserved and nurtured from birth uh, when he was actually plucked out of the, from the reeds or whatnot by Pharaoh's daughter and given a noble upbringing with his real mother attending him as a nursemaid. And then later as a man, his election as deliverer was sealed when God, the I Am, called and ordained him at the burning bush in Exodus chapter 3. Second, Moses became the in incomparable deliverer of his people through an unparalleled parallel display of power. Exodus chapter 7 through 12 tells us that the Nile turned to blood. Successive plagues of frogs, gnats, and flies swarmed upon Egypt. Hell and boils afflicted man and beast. And on the dark night of Passover, all firstborn, the firstborn of man and beast who were not under blood, died. With his staff, Moses parted the Red Sea and the people passed through. And with that very same staff, he hit the rock and all Israel drank. These stories and others show that delivering power radiated from Moses' life. Third, he served as Israel's greatest prophet. God communicated to the prophets indirectly through various means, but he communicated directly to Moses as God ex himself explained in Numbers chapter 12, verse 6 through 8. And there it says, If there is a prophet among you from the Lord, I make myself known to him. In a vision, I speak to him in a dream, not so with my servant Moses. He is faithful in all, in all my household. I speak with him directly, openly, and not in riddles. He sees the form of the Lord. In fact, this is how it was when Moses received the Ten Commandments. There in Exodus chapter 34, we see that his exposure to God was so profound, was so great, that his face retained a wonderful radiance. This shows us that he was second only to unfallen Adam in intimacy with God. Fourth, Moses was the lawgiver. See, to the Jew, the law was the greatest thing in the world. And it was Moses who, had, who was the conduit for the Ten Commandments, the Levi Le Levitical laws, the sacrificial practices, and the tabernacle. Everything in the religion recalled his name. For it all came from the law of Moses. Fifth, he was Israel's great historian. Under divine inspiration, he authored the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. That's Genesis through Deuteronomy. Sixth, it says, it says in Numbers chapter 12, verse 3, that he was a very humble man, more so than anyone on the face of the earth. Isn't that remarkable? I find that absolutely remarkable that he was the greatest, but here's the thing, it never went to his head. Why? Because of everything that he had gone through during the second 40 years of his life. If you want to know about that, you can read Exodus chapter 2 to 4. It, it simply humbled him, everything that he went through there in those second 40 years of his life. 
Uh, all this to say that these six qualities, among others, can be summed up under one grand heading. Moses, the great apostle and high priest of the Old Testament. Apostle means one who was sent. And Moses certainly was that because he was called by God, appointed by God, and sent by God as his representative both to his people and to the court of Pharaoh. As to his priestliness, one commentator explains, it was his brother Aaron and not he who was the high priest of Israel so far as title and investiture were concerned, but it was Moses and not Aaron who was Israel's true advocate with God. See, Moses functioned as the great apostle and the priest of his people, and for this he was revered. When Moses died, it says in Deuteronomy chapter 34 that the Lord himself buried him in an anonymous grave. And many believe, and I lean in this direction as well, that this was because had his grave been known, he probably would have been worshipped. Or people would have been wor worshipping his bones. That's how great, that's how much he was revered by the Jewish people. But in the last three verses of Deuteronomy 34, it closes with Moses' sublime epitaph. No prophet has arisen again in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. He was unparalleled for all the signs and wonders the Lord sent him to do against the land of Egypt, to Pharaoh, to all his officials, and to all his land. And for all the mighty acts of power and terrifying deeds that Moses performed in the sight of all of Israel. So you see, to the Jews, Moses was simply the greatest. He was the goat, the greatest of all time. But it's there where the similarity ends. In the next few verses, the author shows us how in every other respect, Jesus is vastly superior to Moses. First, the Lord Jesus is worthy of more glory than Moses because the builder of a house has more honor than the house itself. The Lord Jesus was the builder of God's house. Moses, well, he was only part of the house. Second, Jesus is greater because he is God. In verse 4, it says, Every house is built by someone, but the one who built everything is God. Now, if you look at John chapter 1, verse 3, Colossians chapter 1, verse 16, and Hebrews here in Hebrews chapter 2 and Hebrews chapter well, Hebrews chapter 1, verses 2 and 10, all those verses show us that the Lord Jesus was an active agent in creation. And so you see the conclusion is therefore unavoidable. Jesus Christ is God. The third point is that Christ is, is greater as a son. In verse 5, we're told that Moses was a faithful servant in all God's house, pointing men forward to the coming Messiah. He testified of those things which would be spoken about in the future. That is, the good news of salvation in Christ. This is why Jesus said in John chapter 5, verse 46, if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. We also see in Luke chapter 4, verse 27, that in his uh, discourse with the disciples on the road to Emmaus, 
beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he, that is Jesus, interpreted for them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. So moving on in the first part of verse 6 in our passage, the writer goes on to say, but Christ was faithful over God's house as a son. As a son, not as a servant like Moses. Now by this point, it should be clear that in his case, sonship means equality with God. And so God, uh, God's house is his own house. In the second part of verse 6, the writer explains what is meant by God's house today. It's composed of all true believers in the Lord Jesus. We're all, we are that household if we hold on to our confidence and the hope in which we boast. Now at first this may, might seem to imply that our salvation is dependent on our holding fast. On our just enduring but if that were the case, our salvation would be, uh, would be by our endurance rather than by Christ's finished work on the cross. However, the true meaning is that we prove we're God's house if we hold fast. Endurance, endurance my friends, is proof of reality. This is the message of the remainder of Hebrews chapter 3. There, the author will exhort God's people to endure. And so let's go there now by picking up in verse 7. And I will read all the way to the end. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 7. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion on the day of testing in the wilderness where your fathers tested me, tried me and saw my works for 40 years. Therefore, I was provoked to anger with that generation and said, they always go astray in their hearts and they have not known my ways. So I swore in my anger, they will not enter my, ra my rest. Watch out, brothers and sisters, so that there won't be any of, any of you an evil, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God, but encourage each other daily while it is still called today, so that none of you is hardened by sin's deception. For we have become participants in Christ if we hold firmly until the end the reality that we had at the start. As it is said, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. For who heard and who rebelled? Wasn't it all who came out of Egypt under Moses? With whom was God angry for for 40 years? Wasn't it with those who sinned? whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that, that they would not enter his rest, if not to those who disobeyed? So we see that they were unable to enter because of unbelief. In verses 7 through 11, the author draws attention to the first generation Israelites and their rebellion against God in the wilderness. He reminds them that God, that God warned, those, warned those Israelites to endure in their faith. But many of them failed. And they failed miserably. Instead of trusting in the one who rescued them out of slavery, they provoked God and were shut out of the promised land. Now, those of you who are familiar with the story know that it was a dreary record of complaint, lust, idolatry, unbelief, and rebellion. 
At Rephidim, for instance, they complained because of the lack of water and doubted God's presence in their midst. At the wilderness at Paran, of Paran, when the unbelieving spies returned with an evil report of discouragement and doubt, the people decided they should go back to Egypt, the land of their slavery. Well, God was so highly incensed that he decreed that the people should wander in the wilderness for another 40 years. Of all those soldiers who came out of Egypt, who were 20 years or older, only two would ever enter the land of Canaan. Do you know who they were? Caleb and Joshua. Now, what's significant about this is that just as Israel spent 40 years in the wilderness, so the Spirit of God dealt with the nation of Israel approximately 40 years after the death of Christ. The nation hardened his heart against the message of Christ. In AD 70, Jerusalem was destroyed and the people were scattered among the Gentile nations. That's what's so significant here. It's, you can see the parallel. So continuing his use of Psalm 95, verse 10 shows them, shows these early, or shows this, these uh, the Jews, that uh, it shows them that God's keen displeasure with Il Israel in the wilderness brought forth stern denunciation. He accused them of perpetual proneness to wander away from him and of a willful ignorance, a willful ignorance of his ways. Then in verse 11, in his wrath, he swore that they would not enter his rest. That is the land of Canaan, the promised land. Verses 12 through 15 Give the application which the Holy Spirit draws for, for us from Israel's experience. As elsewhere in Hebrews, the readers are addressed as brothers and sisters. Now, this doesn't mean that they were all true Christians. So, all who profess to be believers, all of us, all, all of you who have confessed Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior should be constantly on guard against those of, uh, that have a heart of unbelief. Well, then in verse 13, one, we're given one antidote. As uh, it's a mutual, and that one antidote is mutual encouragement. Especially in the last days of, in the days of difficulty and distress, God's people should be daily urging others not to forsake Christ for religions that cannot deal with sin effectively. Notice that this exhortation is not limited to, this, to just those in ministry, but it's the duty, it's the duty of all believers. It's the duty of you and me. It should continue as long as it's called today. That is, as long as God's offer of salvation by grace through faith continues. Today is the accepted time. Today is the day of salvation. Friends, to fall away is to harden is, is to be hardened by sin's deception. And you see, this is what I mean. Sin often looks beautiful in anticipation. Here, it offers escape from the reproach of Christ, lower standards, or lower standards of holiness, rituals that appeal to the aesthetic senses, and the, and the promise of earthly gain. But it is hideous in retrospect. It leaves man with no forgiveness of sins, no hope beyond the grave, 
and no possibility of repentance. Now in verse 14, we're again reminded that we have become participants of Christ. If we hold firmly until the end the reality we had at the start. Verses like this are often misused to teach that a person can be saved and then be lost again. However, such interpretation is impossible because the overwhelming testimony of the Bible that salvation is freely bestowed by God's grace, purchased by God's blood, received by man's faith, and evidenced by his good works. See, true faith always has the quality of preeminence, preeminence. We don't hold fast in order to retain our salvation, but as proof that we have been genuinely saved. Faith is the root of salvation. Endurance is the fruit. Let me repeat that. Faith is the root of salvation. Endurance is the fruit. Who are Christ's companions? The answer is those who by their steadfastness in the faith prove that they really belong to him. In verse 15, the writer concludes the personal application of Israel's experience by repeating the words of Psalm 95, verses 7 and 8. Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. This poignant appeal, once directed at Israel, is now directed at any who might be tempted to forsake the good news and return to the law. Then in verses 16 through 19, the writer closes the chapter with a historical interpretation of Israel's apostasy. In a series of three questions and answers, the writer traces Israel's rebellion, provocation, and retribution. Then he states the conclusion. First, he mentioned rebellion. The rebels are identified as all who came out of Egypt under Moses. Let me ask you, how were the children of Israel delivered from Egypt? To put simply, by blood and water. The blood they applied to the doorsteps before Passover and the water of the Red Sea, which drowned the chariots pursuing them. So too, we are delivered from Egypt, from damnation and destruction by the blood and water that flowed from Jesus' side on the cross of Calvary. Yet, like the children of Israel, although they are delivered from Egypt, too many Christians spend their whole lives wandering between Egypt and the land of abundance. Year after year, they trudge through life thinking, well, this is as good as it gets. That's not what God intended for us, church. He intended to take us out of Egypt, through the wilderness quickly, and into the promised land of the spirit-filled life. Abundant life. You see the promised land in Bible typology is not a picture of heaven. It's a picture of life in the spirit. How do I know this? Because there are neither giants nor battles in heaven. The spirit-filled life is filled with many, many a giant to wrestle, and many a battle to rage, to wage. Only Joshua and Caleb 
realize that giants, battles, wars, notwithstanding, God would indeed give them the promised land. And, and thus, they didn't provoke God. Next, in verse 17, he brings up provocation. It was these same rebels who provoked God for 40 years. There were about 600,000 of them. And by the time the 40 years were ended, the desert was dotted with 600,000 graves. It's a lot of bodies. In verse 18, he brings up retribution. These were the same ones who were excluded from the land of Canaan because of the, their disobedience. The simple recital of these questions and answers should have a profound influence on any who might be tempted to leave the despised minority of true Christians for the vast majority of people who have an outward form of religion but deny the power of Christ, deny the power of godliness. Is the mass majority always right? In this chapter of Israel's history, only two were right, and over half a million were wrong. Do you understand? Do you... Is the, does that get to you? Do you get it? Bible commentator A.T. Pearson emphasized the seriousness, seriousness of Israel's sin as follows. Their unbelief was a fourfold provocation. It was an assault on God's truth and made him a liar. It was an assault upon his power, for it counted him as weak and unable to bring them in. It was an attack upon his immutability, for although they did not say so, their course implied that he was a, cha a changeable God and could not do the wonders he had once wrought. It was also an attack upon his fatherly faithfulness, as though he would encourage uh, an expectation he had no intention of fulfilling. Caleb and Joshua, on the, contrary, on the contrary, honored God by accounting his word absolutely true. His power infinite, his disposition unchangingly gracious, and his faithfulness as such that he would never awaken any hope which he would not bring to fruition. And so finally, the writer concludes by saying in verse 19 that it was unbelief that kept the rebellious children out of the promised land. And it was unbelief that keeps man out of God's inheritance in every dispensation. Jesus reminded us in the parable of the soils with the seeds cast on stony ground and among thorny and among thorns that it is not enough it is not enough to make a good beginning real belief ladies and gentlemen preserves to the end it's not enough just to have a good beginning it's wonderful to make a good start but how we finish is even more important than how we start. Again, listen carefully to this. In his book, The Screwtape Letters, if you haven't read that letter, I recommend it. It's a great book. C.S. Lewis speaks to the difficulty of persistence from a tempting demon's fictional perspective. The enemy has guarded him from you through the first great wave of temptation. But if only he can be kept alive, you have time itself. You have time itself for you, for you ally. The long, dull, monotonous years of middle-aged prosperity or middle-aged adversity are excellent campaigning weather. You see, it is so hard for these creatures to persevere. 
the routine of adversity, the gradual decay of youthful love, loves and youthful hopes, the quiet despair hardly felt his pain of ever overcoming the chronic temptations with which, with, we, with which we have again and again defeated them. The drabness which we create in the lives and our inarticulable resentment with which we teach them to respond to, respond to it. All this provides admirable opportunities of wearing out a soul by attrition. If on the other hand, the middle years from prosperous, our position is even stronger. Prosperity knits a man to the world. He fails, he fails that he is finding his place in it while really it is finding its place in him. That is why we must often wish long life to our patients. Seventy years is not a day too much for the difficult task of unraveling their souls from heaven and building up a firm attachment to the earth. My friends, church, the moral is clear. Beware of the evil heart of unbelief. If we enter into God's rest, then in the coming years, then the coming years will only increase our trust and reliance on Jesus. If by unbelief we fail to enter it, enter in, then the coming years will only gradually draw us away from a passionate, trusting relationship with Jesus. Now, before I end here, before I close, I want to go back a second again and ask you to take another look at the question that was asked in verse 18. To whom did God say, you shall not enter my rest? When I first read this, I would have thought that it would have been those who worshipped idols or those who didn't have their morning devotions. I would have thought that it would have been the immoral men or those who didn't offer sacrifices. Yet, in reality, the only thing that kept the children of Israel from the promised land was their lack of faith. This here is critically important theology. Why? Because the singular sin that kept them from blessing was simply thinking God's promise was just too good to be true. Singular sin, because the singular sin that kept them from blessing was simply thinking God's promise was just too good to be true. Precious friends, you can live the abundant, spirit-filled, successful, exciting, thrilling Christian life if instead of thinking that God can't bless you because you haven't been to Bible study, because you've been yelling at your husband, or because you've had morning, or because you haven't had the morning, morning devotions regularly, you say, I'm, spiritual, I'm a spiritual grasshopper, Lord. But if you want to bring me into this great land of blessing, I'll gladly go in. But let me point out again that the sin of Hebrews chapter 3 is singular. It's not fornication. As destructive as that sin may be, it's not idolatry as sad as that sin is. Rather, it's believing. It's not believing how good God is. A pastor uh, shared this story that I now want to share with you. This is, again, the pastor speaking. When he came home from Bible, from Bible school, my son Peter John shared with me 
how passionate he and his friends were about seeing their generation brought to the kingdom. So I got up early in the morning and pray and spend time in the word. I do so well for about three, for about three or four days, he said. But then I get tired. I sleep in. I miss my devotional, my devotional time. And I don't go to prayer meeting. With tears running down his cheeks, this football-playing son of mine said, Dad, I want to do so well, but I'm not. Peter, I said, when you learn the lesson that took me years and years to understand, you'll be on your way. And that lesson is simply this. Blessing anointing, ministry, faithfulness, and victory are not about you. It's not about the work you do for the Lord. It's about the work he did for you. It's not about the prayer, your prayer to the Lord. It's not about his intercession for you. It's not about your faith in the Lord. It's about his being faithful when you falter. It's all about him being a hero, the prayer warrior, the victory, the victor, the friend, the faithful one. The key, not only to ministry, but, into, but to every area of spirituality is found in John chapter 10. Of John the Baptist, Jesus said, This is the greatest man who ever lived. Yet scripture also records John did no mighty miracles. So what made John the greatest man who ever lived? One thing. He didn't preach on the power of prayer. He didn't propagate victory through discipline. He simply said, behold the lamb. Check him out. Follow him. Happy is a day when a woman grasps the fact that spiritual life has nothing to do with her and everything to do with God. Happy is the day when a man finally realizes, realizes that all he has to say is, I don't know why you put up with this grasshopper like me, but Lord, if you want to allow me to be in ministry, if you want to give me a family, if you want to bless me in the countless ways, it's okay with me. Don't let anyone sell you a bill of goods saying, the reason I'm so successful is because I pray day and night. And the reason you'll never be part of the chosen few is because you don't. Any man or woman can leave, leave here this morning to be used mightily and, bless, and blessed exceeding, exceedingly beyond anything that they could ever ask for. Or even think, if they would just say, I believe you, Lord. Friends, the deceitfulness of sin will try to make you think, I've got to do more. I've got to be bigger, stronger, better in my spiritual walk so that I can be, battle the giants ahead of me. But God says, that's the very sin that will keep you out. Dear saint, it's all about God's work for you, not your work for him. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Be blown away by him. Behold Jesus. Those of you watching and listening this morning, it's a powerful message here. If you've lived your entire life thinking that you have to do all these things in order to gain God's approval, in order to enter into God's kingdom, you're mistaken. God has done all the work already. Jesus died for you on the cross. And all you have to do is come before him. 
and lay your sins before that cross, and he will freely forgive you no matter how bad you've blown it. As I mentioned, you can leave this morning. You can leave here this morning, or you can turn, after you turn off this message, you can truly believe that you are saved, that He is the source of your salvation. All you have to do is say, I believe you, Lord. I confess you, Lord. The Holy Spirit will come into you, give you a new life. And if that's what you'd like to do this morning, if you're tired of living in the wilderness, living in rebelliousness, and now you want to enter the promised land, I want to lead you in a prayer to do that. So wherever you're at, I want you to close your eyes and bow your head. And with all your heart, pray this. Lord Jesus, I know, I admit that I'm a sinner. And now I ask you to forgive me. I believe that you died for my sins and three days later rose from the grave. I now repent of my sins and turn away from them and confess you as my personal Lord and Savior. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for saving me. And so now I ask you that you fill me with the Holy Spirit so that he may help guide me, teach me, and show me. Your ways in my new born-again life. In your name I pray this. Amen. If you prayed, sincerely prayed that prayer, welcome to the family of God. You're, you're now born again, and angels are celebrating now up in heaven for you. We want to hear about it. We want to know that you prayed that, and we want to maybe lead you in your next steps in your Christian walk, walk and help you find a church. Maybe if you're in the area, we'd like to invite you here where you'll be welcomed with open arms. Um, and here you'll continue to grow in the Lord. So if you're in the area, we're in the corner of Hondo Pass and Gateway South here in northeast El Paso, Texas. Um, again, you'll find all that information on our website. For those watching and listening, thank you for joining us this morning. We hope that you were blessed. If you have any questions, again, reach out to us. We'll try to answer them as soon as possible. Wherever you may be, continue to be the salt and light in your communities, in your homes, in your schools. Continue on with the hope, with that, the hope that you have in Christ. Thank you. Have a great week. We love you. Goodbye. Thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope you were blessed by Pastor Angel's message. For more information about Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, such as our service time or how to get connected, please visit our website at fvccelp.com. If the Lord is leading you to give to the ministry of Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, there's a PayPal link in the video description below. Once again, thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope to see you again soon.